Welcome to Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan. My name is Joshua and this is episode 85, The Buddha Comes to Japan. The last couple episodes we've talked about Buddhism. We talked about its origins in the Indian subcontinent with the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama, aka Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, and how those teachings spread out from India to Gandhara and then followed the trade routes across the harsh deserts of the Tarim Basin through the Gansu Corridor and into the Yellow and Yangtze River Valleys. From there, the teachings made it all the way to the Korean Peninsula and to the country of Baekje, Yamata's chief ally there. This episode will look at how Buddhism came to the archipelago and its initial reception there. Now, for the entire story, we're going to have to span several reigns as we'll be looking at events from the early to late 6th century. This time around, we're just going to concentrate on the very first event. Now, this is also more than just religion, and so we may need to dive back into some of the politics we've covered up to this point as well. Hopefully we can bring it all together in the end, but it's a bit of a bumpy ride, just hang with me for a bit. So let's start with the official account in the Nihon Shoki, which we already mentioned two episodes ago, the first mention of Buddhism in the Chronicles. The year was 552, or the 13th year in the reign of Ame Kuniyoshi, a.k.a. Kimmei Tenno. That winter, during the 10th month, which was probably closer to December or January on a modern calendar, King Songmyong of Baekje had a special gift for his counterpart, the sovereign of Yamato. By this time, there are numerous accounts of gifts to Yamato, generally in conjunction with the Baekje-Yamato alliance and Baekje's request for military support in their endeavors on the peninsula usually framed in the Yamato sources as centering on the situation of the country of Nimna. In this case, the gift was a gilt bronze image of Shakyamuni Buddha, several flags and umbrellas, and a number of volumes of Buddhist sutras. King Songmyung sent a memorial explaining his intent. This doctrine, aka Buddhism, is amongst all doctrines the most excellent, but it is hard to explain and hard to comprehend. Even the Duke of Zhou and Confucius had not attained to a knowledge of it. This doctrine can create religious merit and retribution with appreciation of the highest wisdom. Imagine a man in possession of treasures to his heart's content, so that he might satisfy all his wishes in proportion as he used them. Thus it is with the treasure of this wonderful doctrine. Every prayer is fulfilled, and naught is wanting. Moreover, from distant India, it has extended hither to the three Han, where, there are none who do not receive it with reverence as it is preached to them. Thy servant, therefore, Myong, king of Baekje, has humbly dispatched his retainer, Nuri Sachi, to transmit it to the imperial country and to diffuse it abroad throughout the home provinces so as to fulfill the recorded saying of the Buddha, My law shall spread to the east. Upon receiving all these things and hearing the memorial, we are told that the sovereign, Ame Kuniyoshi, literally leapt for joy. He thanked the envoys, but then put the question to his ministers as to how exactly they should proceed. Sogono Iname no Sukune, holding the position of Oomi, recommended that they should worship the statue of the Buddha. After all, if all of the western frontier lands were worshipping it, then should Yamato really be left out? On the other side of the argument were Mononobe no Okoshi as well as Nakatomi no Kamako. They argued against stopping the traditional worship of the 180 kami of heaven and earth and replacing it with the worship of some foreign religion. With this split decision, Ame Kuniyoshi decided to have Sogano Iname experiment first. He told him to go ahead and worship the image and see what happened. And so Soga set it up at his house in Oharida. He purified it and, per Buddhist tradition, retired from the world. He had another house in nearby Mukuhara purified and made into a temple as well, and here he began to worship the Buddha. Around that same time, there was a pestilence, a disease that was in the land. People were getting sick, and some were dying. This was likely not unprecedented. Healthcare was not exactly up to our modern standards, and while many good things traveled the trade routes, infection and disease likely used them as pathways as well so diseases would pop up on occasion. In this instance, though, Mononobe no Okoshi and Nakatomi no Kamako seized on it as their opportunity. 
They went to Ame Kuniyoshi and they blamed Sogono Iname and his worship of the Buddha for the plague. And of course, we today know nothing about seizing on a political opportunity such as disease or plague. Now, accordingly, the court removed the statue of the Buddha and tossed it into the canal at Naniwa. Then they burned down Sogono Iname's temple, which, as you may recall, was basically his house. As soon as they did that, though, Ame Kuniyoshi's own great hall burst into flames, seemingly out of nowhere, as it was otherwise a clear day. Little more is said about these events, but that summer there were reports from Kawachi of Buddhist chants booming out of the Sea of Chinu near the area of Izumi. Unate no Atai was sent to investigate and found an entire log of camphor wood that was quote-unquote shining brightly. So he gave it to the court, and we're told they used it to have two Buddha images made, which later were installed in a temple in Yoshino, presumably at a much later date. Then the chronicles go quiet for the next couple decades, at least on the subject of Buddhism. But this is the first official account of it coming over, and there's quite a bit to unpack. For one thing, the memorials and speeches once again seem like something that the chroniclers added because it fit with their understanding of the narrative, including their insistence that Yamato was a fully-fledged imperial state, and there's some fairly good evidence that King Song Myung's memorial is clearly anachronistic. But there are a few other things and conflicting records, such as the dates and similar. So first off, let's just acknowledge that there are too many things in the main narrative in the Chronicles that are just questionable, such as the Sovereign leaping with joy at the chance to hear about Buddhism, and the fact that King Song Myung's memorial apparently quotes a part of the Sutra of the Sovereign Kings of Golden Light, known in Japanese as the Kon Ko Myo Saisho O Kyo. But that translation wasn't done until 703, during the Tang Dynasty, by the monk Yi Jing in the city of Chang'an. While it would have been known to knowledgeable monks like Doji, who may have been helping put the narrative together in 720, it is unlikely that it was in use during the 6th century when the memorial is said to have been written. In addition, there's a question about the date that all of this supposedly happened. The Nihon Shoki has the event taking place in 552, well into the reign of Ame Kuniyoshi. However, there are at least two 8th century sources, roughly contemporary with the writing of the Nihon Shoki, the Gangoji, Garan Engi, and the Joguki. Both of these put the date at 538, a good 14 years earlier, and in the era of Ame Kuniyoshi's predecessor, Takeo Hiro Kuniyoshi, aka Senka Tenno. The first of these, the Gangoji Garan Engi, is a record of the founding of the first permanent temple in Japan, Gangoji, aka Hokoji, or informally, Asukadera, which was founded by Sogano Iname's heir, Sogano Umako. More on the temple itself later, but for now we want to focus on the historical aspects of this account, which mostly corroborate the story, talking about Sogano Iname's role in receiving the image and enshrining it, as well as the early conflict between the Soga clan and their rivals. The other source, the Joguki, focuses on the life of Shotoku Taishi, a.k.a. Prince Umayado, who will become a major subject of our narrative at the end of the 6th and early 7th centuries. Not only is he considered the father of Japanese Buddhism, but he had strong connections to the Soga family. Today, most scholars accept the 538 date over the 552 date when talking about Buddhism's initial arrival into the island. If the chroniclers did move the event from 538 to 552, one has to wonder why. This isn't a simple matter of being off by 60 years, and thus attributable to a mistake in the calendrical sexagenary zodiac cycle of stems and branches, so there must have been something else. One suggestion is that the date conflicted with the chronology that had already been set for the sovereigns. 538 is during the reign of Takeo no Okimi a.k.a. Senka Tenno, but what if succession was not quite as cut and dried as all that? What if Ame Kuniyoshi no Okimi had his own court and was in some way ruling at the same time as his half-brothers, Magari no Ohine and Takeo no Okimi? They were from different mothers and thus different factions at court. Ame Kuniyoshi was young, so it's possible that there were rival lineages attempting to rule or 
even broker some kind of co-ruler deal, hearkening back to the more ancient precedent. Some even theorize that Magari no Ohine and Takeo Hiro Kuniyoshi were simply fictional inserts to help span the period between Ohodo and Ame Kuniyoshi for some reason. Whatever their thinking, this theory suggests that it would not have happened in the 13th year of Ame Kuniyoshi's reign, but that his reign started maybe in 526 rather than 540. It's an intriguing hypothesis, but one that begs the question of whether everything in the reign would then need to be shifted to account for that. Given that there are a few attributable events noted that fit with outside sources as well, that doesn't seem quite as plausible without some very conscious efforts to change the timeline. Another thought is that the compilers weren't sure exactly when this event happened, but given Ame Kuniyoshi's reputation and long reign, they chose his reign to place it in because it just fit. I suspect that this happened more than once, with people more likely attributing past events to well-remembered sovereigns. And if this is the case, then when searching for a date, they may have just chosen one that seemed auspicious. In this case, 552 CE was, in some reckonings, an important year in Buddhist history, as there were those who say it was the beginning of the age of Mappo, that is, the end of the law, or perhaps the latter days of the law, depending on how you translate it. This definitely is an intriguing theory and resonates strongly. For most of Japanese history, the idea that we are in the period of Mappo has had a strong influence. To a certain extent, it's kind of an apocalyptic view of things. The idea of Mappo is that while the Buddha was alive, his teachings were fresh and available to all living things. However, after his death, his teachings had to be remembered and passed on. Even with the advent of writing, the meaning and understanding of his teachings, and thus an understanding of Dharma, would also atrophy. Different translations, changes in meaning, and just bits and pieces lost to time would mean that for the first 500 to 1,000 years, the Buddha's disciples, they'd keep things well and the meaning would be protected, but then the next 500 to 1,000 years, things would then start to decline. Still, it would probably be pretty close to the truth. But then, after that 1,000 to 2,000 years, this is when the period of Mappo starts and things would really start to decline, until finally about 5,000 to 10,000 years later, or about 6,000 to 12,000 years after the time of the historical Buddha, things would really break down, factions would be fighting one another, and eventually everyone would have forgotten the Dharma entirely. It was only then that there would come a new Buddha, Miroku or Maitreya, who would once again teach about the Dharma and how to escape suffering, and the whole cycle would start again. The year 552 would have coincided, according to some accounts, with 1,000 years since the time of Siddhartha Gautama, and so it would have had particular significance to the people who were compiling this record, particularly if you counted each of the first two ages as only 500 years each, meaning that the word of the Buddha, that is teachings, would spread to the east, would have been completed just as we entered the latter days of the law. Regardless of the time, and as I said earlier, 538 is the more accepted date, the general events described, the statue, the offer of Soga to experiment, the resulting events are usually agreed to, although even here we must pause slightly and ask a few questions. First off, was this truly the first time that Buddhism had ever shown up in Japan? The answer to that is probably not. There had been many waves of immigrants that had come over to Japan from the peninsula, and even if only a small handful of them had adopted the new religion before coming over, it's likely that there were pockets of worshippers. Later, we'll see that there are people in Japan who are said to have had prior experience as a monk, or who had their own Buddhist images. Now, these images were probably used privately by people in their homes. There's no evidence of any particular temples that have been built, privately or otherwise, and so there's no evidence that we have any active monks or nuns in the archipelago. But who knows what was going on in communities outside the elite core? Remember, there were plenty of things that were never commented on if it wasn't directly relevant to the court. Furthermore, with all the envoys that had been sent to Bekje, surely some of them had experience with Buddhism. And then there were the envoys from Bekje, who no doubt brought Buddhist practices with them. 
So there was likely some kind of familiarity with the religion's existence, even if it wasn't necessarily fully understood. The second point that many people bring up is the role of the sovereign, Ame Kuniyoshi, or whomever was in charge at the time the first image came over. While the Nihon Shoki attempts to portray a strong central government with the sovereign at its head, we've already seen how different households had arisen and taken on some measure of power for themselves. At the end of the 5th and the early 6th century, the Ootomo and Mononobe houses were preeminent, with Ootomo Kanamura taking on actions such as negotiating dealings with the continent and even maneuvering around the crown prince. The Mononobe wielded considerable authority through their military resources, and now the Soga appeared to be ascendant. It's quite possible that the idea of the sovereign giving any sort of permission or order to worship Buddhism is simply a political fig leaf added by the chroniclers. The Soga may have been much more independent in their views and dealings. To better understand this, let's take a look at the Uji family system and the Soga family in particular. Now the Nihon Shoki paints a picture as though these noble Uji families were organic and simply part of the landscape descending from the Kami in the legendary age, with lineages leading down to the present day. Though there is some acknowledgement that the earliest ancestors at least did not necessarily use the family names until a later date. For much of Japanese history, the concept that these family, or Uji, were one of the core building blocks of ancient Japanese political and cultural spheres is taken as a matter of course. However, in more modern studies, this view has been questioned, and now the prevailing view is that these families are somewhat different. In fact, the Uji are likely just as much an artificial construct as the corporate Bay family labor groups. According to this theory, early on, peoples were associated with groups and places. Outside of the immediate family, groups were likely held together by their regional ties as much as anything else. Names appear to be locatives, with ancient titles indicating the hiko or hime of this or that area. Sometime in the 5th century, Yamato, and possibly elsewhere on the peninsula, began to adopt the concept of bay corporate groups from Bekje. We talked about this back in episode 63, using the Hata as a prime example of how these groups were brought together. More importantly, though, was that each of these bay groups reported to someone in the court, sometimes with a different surname. These were the Uji, created along with the bay to help administer the labor and work of running the state. They were essentially arms of the state itself in many ways. The Kabane system of titles emphasizes this with different families having different ranks depending on what they did, whether locally, regionally, or at the central court. Some of these titles, like Omi and Kimi, were likely once actual jobs, but eventually it came to represent something more akin to a social ranking. There have been some questions and emails asking for a bit more in depth on this, and I'd really like to, but I'm afraid that would be a little too much for now, at least in this episode. At the moment, I want to try to focus more on the Uji, particularly on those at the top, those Uji with the Kabane of either Omi or Muraji as these are the ones most likely to be helping to directly run the government. They even had their own geographical areas within the Nara Basin and elsewhere that were Uji strongholds. The Hata had areas near modern Kyoto, the Mononobe clearly had claims to land around Isonokami in modern Tenri, and the Soga clan had their holdings in the area of modern Asuka and Kashihara city. At the very least, this is where Sogano Iname's house was, in Mukuhara and Oharida, both located in the modern area of Asuka, which will become rather important in the future. It wasn't just the land holdings that were important, though. Each Uji had some part to play in the functioning of the government. In many cases, it was the production or control of a particular service, such as the Hata and the silk weaving, or the Mononobe and their affinity with all things military. For the Soga, they appear to have had rather an interesting portfolio. Now, traditionally, the Soga family is said to trace its lineage back to Takechi no Sukune, the first Omi back in the time of Okinaga no Tarashihime and Homurowake no Okimi. See episode 46 for more on him. That lineage, however, is likely fabricated, and the earliest actual evidence for the family may be from the Kogo Shui, where we're told that Soga no Machi was put in charge of the three treasuries. These were the Imikura, or sacred treasury, 
the Uchikura, or Royal Household Treasury, and the Okura, the Government Treasury. This seems like quite the position of responsibility, and it would fit with some of what we see later, as the Soga are involved in helping set up Miyake, the various royal storehouses across the land that acted as Yamato court administrative centers for the purposes of collecting goods and funneling them to the court, as well as keeping an eye on the local regions. Although, here I feel I would be remiss if I didn't also note that three treasuries, or sanzo, is another way to translate the term tripitaka, and given the soga's role, I don't think I can entirely ignore that point. So the Soga family had experience with administration, and specifically they were dealing with a variety of different goods produced in different regions. If that is actually the case, then their authority did not necessarily derive from the standard Uji Bay constructed familial connections, but rather they were deriving positional authority from the central government itself. This may seem like common sense to us, but in the world of ancient Yamato, where family connections were everything, this may have been something new and innovative, and very in keeping with various continental models of administration. It's quite likely that the Soga were dealing with some of the latest innovations in government and political authority, which would also have opened them up to the possibility of new ideas. In addition, their position meant that they likely had wide-ranging contacts across the archipelago and even into the peninsula. The Soga themselves have connections to the peninsula in the names of some of their members, such as Sogo no Karako, where Karako can be translated as son of Gara, or a son of Gaia, possibly referring to their origins. And then there's Sogo no Koma, where Koma is a general term for Goguryo, and so quite possibly indicates a connection with them as well. On top of that, there is a now out of favor theory that once suggested that Sogo no Machi might be the same as Mokumachi, an important Bekje official in the late 5th century. While that has largely been discredited, the fact that Machi is possibly of Bekje origin cannot be entirely overlooked. Then there are a series of notes in the Nihon Shoki, particularly surrounding the area of Shirai and the land of Kibi. These start in 553, just one year after Sogono Iname's failed attempt to launch a Buddhist temple, at least according to the Nihon Shoki's record of events. A relatively simple note, but it mentions how Sogono Iname made a man by the name of Wang Jinne the Funa no Fubito, or recorder of ships, and put him in charge of the shipping tax, all at the behest of the sovereign, of course. Later in 555, Sogo no Iname went with Hozumi no Iwayumi no Omi to Kibi, where they consolidated five districts, or agata, under the administration of a single administrative miyake in Shirai. Later in 556, he would go back to Kibi and establish a miyake in Kojima, putting in place Katsuraki no Yamada as the Tazukai, or rural rice field governor. That same year, he and others went to the Takachi district in Yamato and established the Miyake of Omusa, or Great Musa, for immigrants from Bekje, and then Womusa, or Small Musa, for immigrants from Goguryeo. In 569, that person that Sogono Iname had put in charge of recording the ships, Wang Jinne, whose name clearly indicates that he was not a uh, native of the archipelago, well, he had a nephew, Itsu, possibly Danshin, depending on how you read it. Well, his nephew went out to Shirai to take a census. This is the same Shirai that Sogono Iname had helped establish in 555. Itsu becomes the Shirai no Obito, and in 574 we see Sogono Umako, Iname's heir, heading out to Shirai with an updated register for Itsu. So in short, the Soga family clearly is doing a lot of government administration, and particularly of the Miyake, which is the extension of the court authority into the rest of the archipelago. On top of that, look at how often the names that are coming up in conjunction with what they're doing are referencing immigrant groups. Even the Hozumi family are known at this point for their work on the peninsula, and we see the Soga heavily involved with the Wang family and their fortunes. Not to mention Greater and Lesser Musa and the Bekje and Goguryeo individuals there. Wang Jinye will have even more of a role to play, but we'll hold on to that for later. Well, given everything we can see about how they're operating, is it any surprise that the Soga would advocate in favor of Buddhism? 
I'd also note that while other clans have clear connections to heavenly ancestors and kami whom they worshipped, it's unclear to me if the soga had anything similar. There's mention in the 7th century of the creation of a shrine to their titular ancestors, Takechi no Sukune and Ishikawa no Sukune, and today there is a shrine that's dedicated to Sogatsuhiko and Sogatsuhime, basically just Lord and Lady of Soga. But there isn't anything like the spirit of Futsunushi or Omononushi, let alone in a Materasu or a Susano. Why is this important? Well, prior to the 6th century, a lot of clans claimed authority from the ritual power they were perceived to wield, often related to the prestige of their kami. One of the ways that Yamato influence had spread was through the extension of the Miwa cult across the archipelago, and there were even members of the Himatsuribe and the Hiyokibe, basically groups of ritualists focused on sun worship, which upheld the royal house. The Mononobe controlled Isonokami Shrine, where they worshipped their Ujigami, Futsumitama, the spirit of the sound of the sword. And then there were the Nakatomi, who haven't had much to do in the narrative so far, but we know that they were court ritualists, responsible for ensuring that proper rituals were carried out by the court for Kami to help keep balance in the land. The dispute between the Soga and the Mononobe and the Nakatomi is presented as a struggle between a foreign religion and the native kami of Japan, leaving aside any discussion for now about just how native said kami actually were. This is, in fact, the primary story that gets told again and again that the Mononobe and the Nakatome were simply standing up for their beliefs, sincerely believing that if too many people started worshipping foreign gods, then it would supplant the worship already present in the lands and probably piss off the kami in the process. And that may have been a genuine fear at the time, but I would suggest that it was only part of what was going on. What seems more apparent is that we're really looking at just an old-fashioned power struggle, because what all of this information we have about the Soga distills down to is, they were the new kid on the block. The Soga were the up-and-coming nobility. They had connections with the continent and various immigrant groups. That gave them access to new ideas and new forms of resources. The Mononobe were built on a more traditionalist line. They had been around ever since at least Wakataki no Okimi, playing a significant role in things alongside the Otomo. The Mononobe were at their apex, claiming descent through their own heavenly grandson, and having held sway at court through numerous reigns at this point. They represent, in many ways, the old guard. Worship of a fancy new religious icon, effectively a new kami, threatened to give Soga even more power and sway. They already had control of the three treasuries, if the Kogoshui is to be believed, and likely had a rather impressive administrative apparatus. Soga no Iname had also ended up successfully marrying off two of his daughters to Ame Kuniyoshi, making him father-in-law to the current sovereign. If he added to that a spiritual focus that people came to believe in, that would only enhance the Soga's power and place in the hierarchy. What better way to taint all of that and neutralize these upstarts than to blame this new god for the plague and pestilence that was killing people? We see it all too often, even today. When people are scared and when there are problems, the easiest people to scapegoat are the foreigners and the outsiders, those whom we do not see as us. It was probably easy to turn the court against Buddhism, at least initially. They threw the image in the canal, burned down the temple, and no doubt they were quite pleased with themselves. That was merely the opening salvo, and as we'll see in the coming years, the Soga family were hardly done with Buddhism. One can argue whether they were truly devout or if this was merely for political gain, but the Soga family tied themselves to this new foreign religion, for good or for ill, and they wouldn't be pushed around forever. When next we touch base on this topic, we'll look at Sogono Iname's heir, Sogono Umako, and his attempts to start up where his father left off. He would again clash with the Mononobe, and the outcome of that conflict would set the path for the next half a century. It would also see Buddhism become firmly established with the apparatus of the state. As this happens, we'll also see the character of Buddhist worship in the archipelago change. Initially, the Buddha was treated little differently from any other kami, and based on the way it is described, probably worshipped in a very similar manner. However, as more sutras came to light and as more people studied and learned about the religion, 
And as more immigrants were brought in to help explain how things were supposed to work, Buddhism grew in the islands and came to be its own distinct entity. In fact, the growth of Buddhism would even see the eventual definition of Shinto, the way of the gods, a term that was never really needed until there was another concept for native practices to be compared against. Before we leave off, there is one other story I'd like to mention. It's kind of tangential to our immediate discussion of Buddhism in the Soga, but I think you may find it of interest nonetheless. And that's the story of just what happened, supposedly, to that first Buddhist icon that was tossed into the Naniwa Canal. Because you see, according to tradition, that gilt bronze icon did not just stay stuck in the mud and muck of the canal, nor did it just disappear. Instead, there is a tradition that it was found almost a century later. The person who retrieved it was named Honda no Yoshimitsu, and from Naniwa, he traveled all the way to Shinano, to the area of modern Nagano, and there he would found a temple in 642. Another reading of his name, Yoshimitsu, is Zenko, and so the temple is named Zenkoji, and you can still go and visit it today. In fact, the main hall of Zenkoji, built in the Edo era, is considered a national treasure, and it was featured prominently during the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. It's a popular attraction for tourists both in Japan and from abroad, and if you get a chance, I highly recommend going to see it. On the street leading up to the temple entrance are many traditional shops that still sell various foods and traditional arts and crafts. There are many intriguing features of the temple itself. For example, there's this one place, it's a narrow walkway underneath the main temple, that's completely dark, and you're meant to feel along the wall to try to find the key to enlightenment, a kind of physical metaphor of Buddhist teaching. And of course, there's also that icon that Honda Yoshimitsu is said to have fished out of the canal. According to the temple, the icon still exists, and many worshippers believe it to be the oldest extant Buddhist icon in Japan, even older than the icons at Horyuji. However, there is one catch. Nobody is allowed to see it. Not even the chief priest at the temple. Shortly after it was installed in the temple, the statue was hidden in a special container, or zushi, and it became what is known as a hidden Buddha. This is a tradition particularly prevalent in Japan, where some Buddhas are hidden away and only brought out on very special occasions. Some cynics might know that those occasions are often when the temple needs to raise funds. As for this hidden Buddha, however, it has not been seen more than a handful of times since it was locked away back in the 7th century. Despite that, we know what it looks like, or at least what it's supposed to look like. The image is said to be a triad, and though the Nihon Shoki claims it was an image of Shakyamuni, the central figure of Zenkoji triad is actually a figure of Amida, aka Amitabha as in the Pure Land sect of Buddhism. Now, Amida, or Amida Nyorai, is flanked by two attendants. We know all of this because a copy of the Zenkoji image was made in the Kamakura period, and that image is said to be a faithful recreation of the original, which is also kept at Zenkoji. While the original is kept hidden in the back, the replica, which is thought to have all the same miraculous powers of the original, sits in front and is therefore called the Maidachi Honzon, basically the image standing in front, vice the original, the Gohonzon, the main image. Except that it gets even better, because the replica is also kept hidden away most of the time, and only revealed on special occasions known as Gokaicho, or opening of the curtain, which occurs once every seven years. The Zenkoji triad became extremely important in later centuries, and copies were made and installed in sub-temples throughout Japan. Even today, you may find a Zenkoji-style triad here or there, each one considered to have a spiritual tie back to the original, and some of them even have inscriptions confirming that they are indeed Zenkoji-style triads. Of course, the big question remains, does the original image actually still exist? And is there any chance that it is actually as old as it claims to be? Unfortunately, there really is no good way of knowing. Zenkoji is not offering to open up the Zushi anytime soon. We do, however, know a few things. We know that the temple has suffered fire and burned down at least 11 times over the years, 
that the Gohonzon was rescued each time, or so they say. There are some who claim that it still exists, but perhaps it's damaged. If that is the case, then how did they make the replica? There was an inspection during the Edo period. There was a rumor, you see, that it had been stolen, and so an Edo official was sent to check on the status. They reported that it was still there, but crucially, they never described actually laying eyes on the statue. In one account, where a monk did open the box, it said that there was a blinding light, kind of like the Ark of the Covenant in Indiana Jones, but just overwhelming. No faces were melted, at least none that were reported. The monks of Zenkoji, when asked how they know the image is still there, will point to the weight of the container, which, when lifted, is apparently considerable. They say that's how they know it's still there. Of course, a melted lump of metal might be the same weight as it was when it was a full statue, as long as it didn't lose any mass, so it's hard to tell if it's still in good condition. Even with all that, there is the question about the veracity of the original object's lineage to begin with. Did Honda Yoshimitsu really just find the original statue? Even if he did, how would we have known what it was? Was there an inscription on the back? To Yamato from Bekje, hugs and kisses. I've yet to see anyone directly compare the purported replica with other statues, but I suspect that would be the route to at least check the age. But nobody seems to be saying that the style of the replica is blatantly wrong for a 6th or 7th century icon, from the peninsula or by peninsular craftsmen. Then again, there were plenty of local immigrants in the Naniwa area who could have potentially crafted the image. Indeed, the area around modern Nagano even has traces of Goguryeo-style burial cairns, possibly from immigrants settled out there to help with the early horse cultivation. So there is even the possibility that there were locals with connections and skills to craft something. If you really want to know more, there is an entire work by Donald McCollum titled Zenkoji and its icon, and not just the icon, but the entire worship that sprang up around it caused copies to be spread throughout the archipelago. For now, I think we'll just leave ourselves wondering about whether this really is the first icon that came to Japan. And that's where we'll leave off this episode. The next couple of episodes, I want to finish up some of the secular history of this reign and look a bit outside of Yamato and the evidence in the Chronicles as well. Until then, thank you for listening. Thank you for all of your support. If you like what we're doing, please tell your friends and feel free to rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. If you feel the need to do more and want to help us keep this thing going, we have information about how you can support and donate on Patreon or through our coffee site, ko-fi.com slash sengokudaimyo, or find the link over to our main website, sengokudaimyo.com slash podcast, where we'll have some more discussion on topics from this episode. Also, feel free to tweet at us at, at Sengoku Podcast or reach out to our Sengoku Daimyo Facebook page. You can also email us at the Sengoku Daimyo at gmail.com. That's all for now. Thank you again, and I'll see you next episode on Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan.